uh, species durations. So, like Daniel, I'm actually a paleontologist, apparently. So, a lot of what I talk about is paleontological data, and here we're going to be talking about kind of how long does a species persist in the fossil record. So, essentially, a major motivating question in paleobiology and arguably evolutionary biology in general is why do certain species go extinct when others don't? And why do they go extinct in different rates? It's kind of underlined everything behind the paleobiological kind of approach to evolution. I think it's a major part of biological current methods now. But really, that's, that's a very difficult question to work with. Why questions are not amenable to analysis. So you have to focus your questions. So I'm going to be looking at the fossil record of North American animals in the Cenozoic for the last 65 million years. And I'm mainly looking at kind of three different ideas. How do mammal species traits affect extinction rate at risk? These are things like uh, ecology, time of origination, phylogenetic position, body size, various measures that we can obtain from the fossil record. And something that has kind of been interesting is that as we approach the, the, the recent extinction rates have been decreasing. And so what we've not known is if this is just a product of buildup uh, within certain low uh, extinction clades or if this is actually something phenomenal. Now, and then of course, because I'm working with mammals in modern, we can, uh, we can then compare these results to the modern and be like, oh, are we in a mass extinction or not? I'm sure you'd be hearing news all about that. Um, and then of course, a big question coming out of the 70s uh, from uh, Lee Van Valen's work, the, uh, his Red Queen paper was actually called uh, A New Evolutionary Law, and it was about the law of constant extinction. And it's from there we had the assumption that we assume that if we state that uh, species extinction risk is age independent, that, it can, that it's a memoryless process, and that's not the test. But really, here I'm just going to be focusing on this, this ecology system, like how, how does uh, the ecology of individual organisms affect uh, the extinction risk of that species. So one thing we do know, I would argue, <laughs> know, is that if you have a larger geographic range, you have a lower extinction risk. And this you can base entirely on random processes. If you are present on the entire globe and another species are only present on half the globe and you destroy half the globe, you're more likely to survive. It's, it's that simple. And so I would say we know that. It's one of the few things we know. Sometimes it doesn't hold. The other one, for other traits in terms of extinction, it's a little lost uh, in terms of developing major hypotheses. There's so many different traits we can look at, and really what we end up going back to of all things is Simpson in the 40s with his uh, kind of statement here, when related phyla die out, more specialized phyla tend to become extinct before less specialized. This phenomenon is also far from universal, but it is so common that it does use a recognition as a rule or principle in evolutionary studies. This is the rule of the survival of the non-specialized. Now remember in the 40s, uh, when, we, when they say phyla, we would say taxa. So that was just the, the way the language worked. So given this kind of basic rule, which we've shown to work a few times, we can make some statements about, say, a dietary category, where you would say, say, blue is something like omnivory, and the other colors are more specialized versions of that carnivory omnivory. We would say that, oh, those, those more specialized taxa are more likely to go extinct uh, or have shorter durations than the more generalized taxa. Very basic. We can then, for example, locomotor category, if we're moving from an environment with potentially equal, closed and open, with some mixed sensoriality, a mixed environment for sensorial taxa. And then as we observe in the Cenozoic, we go to an environment with much less closed and much more open environments. We would assume that taxa that can survive in either both or open environments are going to have long durations because their environment is more stable. Now, the key is, there's a lot of information you have to deal with with paleontological analysis and evolutionary analyses in general. As we collect more and more data, we know more and more of it is structured, very, very structured. We would call these pseudo-replications at a different time. The idea that certain things are all drawn from, say, one period of time and others are all drawn from another, or that things are from one spatial environment and from another. For example, if you were to think about, uh, I, I like this example, um, with drug trials, you would want to know what the effect of the drug, what the effect of the drug is, and what the effect of the hospital. So if you're comparing across hospitals, you want to know where that contribution is coming in. And so this is really necessary to do. And if you've ever heard of, say, like a mixed effects modeling structure.
structure. It's similar. I, I use a hierarchical Bayesian approach because I really like the regularizing powers. But really, the idea is we're just trying to incorporate as much information about the system simultaneously as possible. So I, this is mostly nonsense, but it's it's a diagram of, of the model I'm working with. It's a it's a classic survival model where we say that durations are drawn from some probability distribution, classically either exponential, which corresponds to the law of constant extinction, or a wider distribution, which is slightly more flexible. And then from there, we can add in all this information, like the ecology of the system, uh, or the um, dietary category, the locomotor category, the body size, its time of origination, which we then model as exchange, <coughs> or its phylogenetic position, which we follow very basic uh, multivariate normal, which Brownian motion. <laughs> so from there, and then we can move on and then look at some posterior distributions of our parameter estimates, and that is very precise at the hypothesis. So just to kind of prove that the model fits, here's a very basic posterior predictive check. I have more if you're interested. But the basic idea is the black line represents an empirical, uh, the observed uh, survival uh, function. The survival function or the probability that if you have lived till a certain age, that you will continue to live. And, the, and that's shown in black. In gray are a thousand draws from the posterior uh, compared to that. And as you can see, some of it's a little ragged towards the edges, but the general idea is our wider model fits a little bit better, which is weak evidence for um, the law of constant extinction not being a law, but that's for another time. So, but we can move on to these ecological traits. Here's the, the Pairwise differences in the effect of these environment of these dietary categories. We have carnivory versus herbivory, carnivory versus insectivory, and so on. Of the important here are omnivory, where values that are more positive indicate that the second is uh, increases uh, uh, duration. So in this case, it's omnivory is expected to have a greater duration than either insectivory or herbivory. And then you can do the same thing with herbivory, insectivory, and so on, where this is carnivory and omnivory. So in general, we see that, yeah, it's great to be an omnivore. And by rather appreciable amount, these are uh, approximately uh, at least 95% probability that an that omnivorous species will have a greater duration than an insectivorous species. So we can do similar things with uh, locomotor category, where we have arboreality versus ground dwelling. It's great to be ground dwelling. It's not great to be arboreal. Similar situ situation with arboreality and scansoriality. Scansoriality is a term in, uh, just describing that you can do kind of both. Mostly it's you live in a on roots and stuff like that. You can think of mice. And then we have ground dwelling and scansoriality, which are kind of, uh, no evidence that one is necessarily better than the other, or no strong evidence. But it's again this, this idea that if you have a more generalized system, this ground dwelling or scansoriality, you're more likely to have a greater duration of the fossil record. Um, if you're arboreal, or you might be having a, a greater risk of habitat loss. We can then look at what's the difference in these origination cohorts. Origination cohorts here are defined as a species that all originate in the same two million year window. This is some way of getting at uh, how you temporal effects uh, work on duration. We see a weak trend of a, of a decrease in extinction risk. So negative values of that indicate a decreased extinction risk over time as, as we approach the recent where things are potentially living longer on average. Though if this is based entirely on those arboreal taxes, it's a little hard to pull out because I've not varied uh, the effect of arboreality over time. Latitude time constant. But so this is cool. The key is then is is there any element of phylogeny? We would argue that a lot of these traits are heritable, I would say. You know, your dietary category is probably heritable. Uh, so we can look, and this is uh, called a variance partitioning coefficient. The idea is we're looking at the source of the unmodeled variation. And the, though this is a non normally attributed approach, there are various ways of getting over that. And we can see the individual variation, the variation just between the species is uh, providing approximately 70% of the unmodeled variation, where in total we're talking maybe 30 
between cohort and phylogeny, which are approximately equal in terms of their contribution to unmodeled uh, un um, depth variation. This states that it's both time and phylogeny matter, that this heritability of traits, but also <coughs> that it's, it's a kind of happening regardless of where you are at the same time, uh, that in the phylogeny at the same time. This makes sense. If omnivorous, omnivorous <coughs> have to live a long time, they can, even with a very slow speciation rate, just kind of build up and build up and build up, because they just aren't going extinct. As opposed to something, say, that was a greater risk, anything else. So that's fun, because this is something that's been an issue since Robin Setkowski first observed a uh, decrease in extinction risk. Their theory was entirely due to adaptation, that as we approach uh, the recent, it's entirely due to adaptation, when in fact it might be kind of a more complex scenario. Now, there's some basic conclusions, again. This survival being specialized, turns out Simpson was really smart. Uh, and we can say that, at least for North American mammals, that these more generalized species are going to have the lower extinction risk. Doesn't mean anything about their speciation rate, just entirely their extinction rate. We've observed a decrease in extinction risk with time, but this is, is not solely due to the inheritance of traits. That also has to do with change in selective pressures over time, arguably. And I've not shown it, but there's actually some incongruence with risk factors in the recent, uh, specifically issues with body size. I've included body size in the analysis and not shown it here because uh, it had no effect. I've also not shown you range size because it's not a result if you're getting that if, if you're getting exactly what you expect. Um, so the, we have in the recent strong selection on body size and are in certain clades, the strength of the phylogenetic clustering is much greater in the recent, and there's differences with trophic categories. For example, it's really, really bad to be a large carnivore in the recent. That's not really what you would say about the new recent So it's some very basic conclusions just, just from this analysis of the traits. And really, that's it. So I'd, I'd like to thank a variety of people, Ken, uh, Ken and Delphine and Michael Foote for telling me to do more, um, various labs for helping me write in English, and uh, various people for helping me along the way. I'd be happy to take questions. So we've, uh, we've run over time for this session, but uh, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, uh, just come up to the front, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and thank all, all our speakers again for